So we've been working throughout this lecture series to get to this point, to actually talk about Darwin's theory of evolution. We talked about who Darwin was and what he actually did and what his life was like, where did he go, when he published his book and everything. We talked about the history of development of evolutionary thought and different scientists and different fields of study that contributed to his ideas. And we then we went over some of the ideas that contributed to our current understanding of evolution as well as the mindset that Darwin had as he developed his theory. It's important to remember the main important points. Darwin knew that the earth was ancient, gradually changing at uniform rates, and that because of these changes, which are sometimes sudden, species cannot sometimes survive unless they have the right set of adaptations, and that there is variation between the species, that species are different from each other, and that these variations are inheritable or they are passed on from generation to generation. And although he did not know how the variations happen, which is through mutations, and how they're passed on through the process of sexual production through meiosis, he did understand that the variations were the key to the process of evolution. Because when populations are pressured by the environment or in the limited resources, without limited resources, they will grow exponentially. But when you have limited resources, they compete and then therefore are going to have to struggle to survive. And that based on their set of adaptations, they're going to be more or less likely to survive. That's the idea he comes up with based on the understanding that he had from before of all of these different things. And so it was important for me to build you up to it so you can see and put yourself in the situation that he was in to try to understand where he was going with all of this. So it all starts from the trying to understand the diversity of life. You see, during Darwin's time, naturalists were all over the place. And they were trying to categorize in all of this different diversity. They, they have what they call the Linnaean taxonomy, which use Linnaean taxonomy and binomial nomenclature to name all life on Earth. And they went on this task to actually categorize every single thing there ever was or ever would uh, be. And they actually went to fossils to track down the passage of on time, old specimens as well. And they were interested in these patterns of biodiversity. Now, as Darwin went around the world, he saw that unique adaptations or leading to variation between and within species. You notice, for example, that a specific finch type would have different kinds of finches within the same species of finch, but that there will also be many different species of finch, and that the types of adaptations they had had everything to do with their diets. When they were in the Galapagos Islands, he noticed that uh, insect eaters had different types of beaks than eaters that had that eat, eat mostly fruits or buds or flowers. And those that ate cactus and seeds had other kinds of beaks. And the ones that ate mainly seeds had other kinds of beak also. And so that depending on what exactly the finches ate, they had different adaptations. And he actually suggested a process of splitting from a supposed common ancestor, which was found in the South American mainland. And he actually saw the common ancestor there. And then he saw that maybe from that ancestor, all of these finches branched through the process of natural selection. But anyhow, he saw that there were unique adaptations that led to variation between and within species. Uh, he also, as he took this trip around the world, he noticed that there was an even distribution of species in terms of space and time. He noticed that there were some species that used to exist that no longer existed. And he saw that on the fossil record. And he also saw the species were also varied across space. For example, how the tortoises and different, different Galapagos Islands would have different features in different areas. So there was geographic variation as well as time-wise variation. Look at how many the kinds of, of iguanas he saw. And he also knew of things like this, for example, how in Australia you have a sugar glider and how in North America you have a flying squirrel which has similar features and because they have similar environments and so and so he saw these patterns of similarity as well because animals had similar functions to perform or similar environment pressures to deal with so the overall result of this is that he realized that there was a lot of diversity in life and he knew about that already before he even studied sail but he found out even more diversity as he traveled around the world and he knew that this diversity has something to do with the environment that existed at a certain period of time or space and that different environments led to different features or adaptations or variations between and within species and that similar features would arrive in similar environments where animals had to perform similar functions. That's actually very interesting. 
uh, kind of like what Lamarck would have said, that environment somehow created the look of the animals. And he therefore collected a lot of specimens and sent them back to, to Europe so that he could actually uh, do his research. And he actually took a lot of fossils as well as live specimens. And he also made, made many drawings and took a lot of notes throughout his journeys to actually try to have physical evidence to substantiate the ideas that he was coming up with. Now, let's think about the assumptions that, uh, that he was going to make. First of all, life is diverse. There's a lot of diversity in life. Okay, remember that. He also has the assumption that uh, populations would increase exponentially if left unchecked, according to what Malthus had said. Also, that environmental resources are limited and that when environmental resources are going to be exhausted, populations will struggle. And because of this, population's growth is hindered by limiting factors. And as the populations approach the limiting factors, they actually start slowing down and dying. This is going to be intrinsic to his idea of natural selection or the fight that animals have to survive. You ever heard of the term survival of the fittest? It's more like the preservation of the fittest. He actually never really coined that word survival of the fittest. It's more like preservation. I will tell you what the difference is in a second. But either way, um, the idea is that only a fraction of the offspring can possibly survive given environmental pressures, when there's starvation, when there's lack of resources. And therefore, the animals must struggle to survive. And which is true even for humans, we definitely have struggled for survive. And that leads to for the struggle of ex for existence. Uh, animals will struggle against other species and against members of their own species for resources, for environmental shelter, for mates, and for all these things. And pressure from the environment will lead to conflict between the, these animals. Now, Whenever you have these conflicts, look at that. You, you see um, predator versus prey confidence. Those are the most common ones that a lot of people talk about. And every time you see an animal show, there's always seem to be this particular conflict featured. There's also conflicts for mates and conflicts for competition for niches. I want to be the top predator of the, of the pond. I want to be the top uh, alpha male. There's also conflicts to uh, survive. Uh, Take advantage of other animals or to be the one out of your species who is the most well placed within a herd so that you do not attack or to be a warning for other animals that I'm dangerous. All of these things are what we call adaptations. Um, these are things which will allow animals to live more than others. See here, for example, you see the flower mantid in this picture? Do you? Well, it's kind of really hard to see it because it's very well uh, camouflaged. Look at this stick minted in flower in uh, Africa. Can you spot it? A little easier than a flower minted. But either way, look at this spore cloud it's coming out of, uh, of a fungus and how many of it does, increasing its reproductive rate. You see? All the ideas are tied into the concept of fitness. Who is more fit, the predator or the prey? Am I a better hunter or am I a better runner? Am I smarter or am I a better evader? Am I tougher than the same member of my species? Am I going to get more mates? And am I tougher than anything living in my pond or my water or my river? Am I tougher than the other penguins? Am I going to be the one to survive the winter? Am I going to be the one that's not going to be eaten by a predator? Am I going to be the one that's going to let people know, do not eat me because I'm dangerous? I'm going to take advantage of someone else to save my energy and strength. These adaptations will make the animal fit to survive. Now, the concept of fitness is kind of, that's what I tell you, it's not really survival of the fittest, it's more preservation of the fittest, because the concept of fitness is not so much just survival. A fit animal is an animal that, yes, survives longer, but it's also an animal that reproduces more often. For example, like the spore we talked about, an animal that has more offspring and that has offspring that survives to do exactly the same. Survive longer and have more offspring. That is the essence of natural selection. The fitness has to do with surviving longer to have more babies that have more babies. In other words, to have the best set of overall adaptations. Or the, or, it's not just one thing. It's not just being smart or being fast or being strong or being venomous. It's the whole package put together that makes you more likely to survive longer have more children, they have more children. And that is the essence of being fit. And so it's not just about surviving, see? It's about having children, who therefore have children. 
and having the best set of features in order to make this a possibility. We'll pick it up from here in the next video where we're actually going to be talking about natural selection. I'll give you some examples and explain what he meant with all these things. See you guys then.